Did you hear about the Italian operation that hacked into military satellites and used them to remotely change Trump votes into votes for Joe Biden? Probably not. That may be because the story dubbed Italygate was debunked as an insane conspiracy theory by Reuters journalists in January after it spread online in the lead up to the Capitol insurrection on January the 6th. Reuters found that it resembles some other pro-Trump election conspiracies alleging overseas tampering that they'd already debunked. But Italygate is special because of who pushed it. Not Marjorie Taylor Greene or Rudy Giuliani or the My Pillow guy. No, Italygate was one of the theories that President Donald Trump's own White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, tried to get the Justice Department to take seriously during Trump's last days in office. Emails uncovered by Congress and obtained by the New York Times show that Meadows pushed acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen to look into fantastical claims of voter fraud, including the so-called Italygate conspiracy as part of a desperate attempt to undermine or perhaps even nullify the election results. You hear people talk a lot about the attempted coup, meaning Donald Trump's lies on January the 6th and the Capitol insurrection that followed. But in fact, there were multiple pro-Trump coup attempts, pro-Trump attempts to subvert, if not outright overturn the election in the past year, not just on January the 6th, which is why we need to keep talking about them, because they're dangerous and they're not going away. Case in point, the ex-president himself. This weekend, in his first speech since reports emerged that Trump ridiculously expects to be reinstated as president this summer, Donald Trump yucked it up with a friendly crowd, the North Carolina Republican Convention. And everything Trump said there was, as usual, false, malicious, and certifiably insane. There's no better example of the Democrat and media corruption than the 2020 election hoax. That election will go down as the crime of the century, and our country is being destroyed by people who perhaps have no right to destroy it, all to satisfy the far-left agenda of AOC, Bernie Sanders, Rashida Tlaib, and Ilhan Omar, who's telling us how to run our country. She comes from a country that's done a wonderful job running their country. Now she's telling us how to run our country. Don't you miss that racism? These were prepared remarks at a state convention of one of the two mainstream political parties in the United States, an arena full of politicians and policymakers, all of whom seem eager to agree with Trump's big lie and the racism, and at least one who's very into Italygate as well. Mark Meadows, everybody, real great guy. The good news, at least, is that nobody outside of the Newsmax OANN conspiracy corner is really listening, right? Even Fox News. Fox News decided not to run Trump's speech live. And with Facebook announcing Trump would remain banned from the platform until at least 2023, his lies aren't getting much of a hearing, right? Look, I consider myself a pretty avid news consumer. It's what I do for a living. I spend a lot of time online. And I certainly haven't seen or heard as much from the ex-president these past months. It's been refreshing, I'll admit. So we're in a good place, right? Not so fast. A new study by The Times looked at Trump's messages before and after his bans from social media companies. It found that while his overall reach had declined, many of his messages are getting as many social media engagements now as they were before he was banned. How? With an assist from friendly right-wing sites and personalities like Breitbart and Fox News, yeah, Fox, and his former election lawyer, Jenna Ellis. Trump, one expert told The Times, has become a kind of digital leader in exile. Imagine if Napoleon was exiled to Elba but could still get all his supporters to pass his messages on, electronically. Now imagine if Napoleon's message was this. Illegal aliens voting, Indians getting paid to vote in certain states, including Arizona and Nevada. Drop boxes paid for by Facebook and Zuckerberg send out millions and millions of ballots. Some people got six, some people got seven ballots. Joe Biden and his family took millions of dollars from the Chinese Communist Party. Insane, dishonest, racist, hateful, anti-democratic, delusional. But he's still going. He's still here. He's still getting the message out. He's soon to go on tour with Bill O'Reilly. 
No, really. The two friends and alleged sexual harassers announced Monday that they will go on a history tour. <laughs> a history tour. Uh, they will go on a history tour together for audiences in Florida and Texas in December. Lucky audiences. And this morning, Fox Business itself played host to Donald Trump with a phone interview in which Trump was praising the filibuster. The same filibuster Trump spent four years bashing on social media, as you can see there. But that's where we are, a right-wing media ecosphere, the fever swamps of the internet, all still enthralled by his twisted, dishonest, dangerous message. American democracy still imperiled. Remember that old saying, a failed coup without consequences is just a training exercise. For more on this, let's bring in Democratic Congresswoman Madeline Dean of Pennsylvania, of Pennsylvania, who served as a House impeachment manager, of course, during February's second impeachment trial of Donald Trump. Congressman, Congresswoman, thanks so much for joining us on the show this evening. I've got to start by asking you, how bonkers is this Italy satellites conspiracy theory? And what do you take away from the fact that the president's chief of staff was telling the nation's attorney general to take this nonsense seriously? Well, uh, Mehdi, it's good to be with you, although I have to say with all the reporting you just went through, my anxiety is up, up, up. Uh, it's incredibly troubling, <laughs> I guess not surprising, that former chief of staff Mark Meadows spent his final days uh, in the White House pressuring our own Department of Justice, pushing some bonkers theory of Italy gate or tampering with our elections. And, and all of the tape you just played of the former president He's very troubling, but probably what is most troubling is those who came around him and who were complicit, even in those final days. Remember what President Trump, former President Trump was doing also. Remember his telephone call that I had the opportunity to put before the American public to Brad Raffensperger, the Republican Secretary of State, telling Brad he just needed to find 11,880 votes. Yes. Because Trump had lost Georgia by 11,879 votes. Just find me one more. Uh, so it's extraordinarily troubling. It is anti-American. It is all the descriptors you used. But most troubling are those who have surrounded him and continue to be uh, yes. faithful to his many lies. And is there a danger, Congresswoman, you mentioned rightly the people around him who've enabled this stuff. Is there a danger that some in your party and some in my industry are focused, overly focused, on the fringe characters, the My Pillow guy, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of this world, when actually it is people like Mark Meadows, former Freedom Caucus chair, former Congress member, chief of staff in the White House, who are pushing this insane, dishonest stuff. That's how mainstream it's become in one of our two major political parties. I think it's troubling for any elected member of Congress, so whether it's Marjorie Taylor Greene or Mark Meadows. But to your point, you're absolutely right. Mark Meadows is a former leader of the House. Uh, imagine that he went into this administration and became so co-opted by it that he would push this disastrous set of uh, conspiracy theories at the end of a desperate presidency. Here's how un-American it is. What we rely upon in our elections, and this one by all accounts was one of the most fair, free elections, free of uh, any kind of rampant uh, integrity problems. What we rely upon is winners and losers taking their place and saying, I ran, I ran as hard as I possibly could. I put forward what I believed and if I won, great. And if I didn't, I need to say I concede. We have a madman who ran. He lost famously, uh, poor, he, he lost in a very, very big way. And as I say, it is those around him, elected leaders, leaders in my own Pennsylvania legislature who continue the big lie, who just recently uh, ran to Arizona so to take a look at fraud audits. Go I'm ahead, glad I'm you sorry. mentioned that because I was about to ask you about what's happening in your own home state. I mean, I, what is going on there in Pennsylvania where you do have Republicans in the state legislature who say they want to audit, quote unquote, the state's 2020 results in the same shambolic, bizarre manner as the Arizona GOP has done. What is happening in your state? What's the latest you've heard about what actually might happen there? Well, I'm a former state legislator. I served six and a half years in the Pennsylvania House. 
under Republican control uh, in both the House and the legislature. So sadly, this is a, a bit more of the same, except this is extraordinarily extreme. Uh, you saw in my own Commonwealth of Pennsylvania the number of lawsuits that came forward, and uh, the former administration was unsuccessful in proving fraud anywhere, literally anywhere. And so to have members, GOP members of the House and Senate travel to Arizona to a fraudulent audit all of these months later when there is no evidence of fraud, it reveals more about them than it does about our election cycle. I, I hope voters are paying attention. I hope they reject this kind of disinformation because think about what they're actually arguing for. They want to disenfranchise millions of voters of my state, millions of whom voted for them. It makes no sense whatsoever. They think yes. they might be able to reinstate somehow the former president who lost terrifically in Pennsylvania and not jeopardize their own elections. What does that say about them? It's always amusing uh, to see Republican House members in some of these states saying the election was stolen in this state, but not my election, just the presidential one. Mine was fine. Um, you were manager. You were, you were, of course, a manager for Donald Trump's impeachment, uh, the second impeachment trial on inciting insurrection in January, which got Republican support in the House, unprecedented bipartisan support in the House for an impeachment trial, but was quashed by Senate Republicans. And yet here's Trump this past weekend spouting the usual lies to his party faithful is there ever going to be any accountability where is the january 6th commission where are the select committee hearings where is the special committee in your chamber what is speaker pelosi up to well thank you for re remembering that i have to tell you Mehdi, and to your viewers it was uh, one of the most solemn honors of my career probably the highest honor of my career no matter how long i i hope to serve uh, to be able to put forward for the American public uh, the terrible, grievous wrongdoings of a president that resulted in an insurrection, an attack, not just on any day at the U.S. Capitol, but a day of a joint session presided over by his own vice president, where they chanted, hang my, Mike Pence. Uh, what, what I believe is we need the independent commission. It was shameful to see a week ago uh, Mrs. Sicknick and Brian Sicknick's partner go door to door in the Senate, draped in their grief, asking only for an independent commission that would reveal the facts and the circumstances. They weren't placing any blame. So what are Republicans afraid of? Understood. Republicans in the House? Republicans. But given they I, are I believe... blocking that, will your party will your party go with a special committee and just investigate on your own and say, we're going to do this? Well, we, I think you would know it's widely reported that the speaker has said, and I agree with her, I hope uh, Leader Schumer will find the votes and bring it up in the Senate and get an independent commission. We know that is the finest path forward, the, the cleanest path forward and the most transparent okay. uh, free, or free of partisan. But we still have the opportunity. She will, I, I believe, if we don't get that, uh, begin a select committee. We also have the oversight I power and capability, independent um, an yep. independent committee. Let me say one thing that I want people to think about. The national security threat continues to this day. It is not as though 1-6 happened in a box and you turn the page to 1-7 and we yep. do not risk anything further. The national security threat whipped up by the former yep. guy uh, continues to this day. You meant you're right about the threat. You mentioned uh, the possibility of votes in the Senate. So let's talk about working with the Republican Party. Congresswoman Dean, if you can stay with us for just a moment, I do want to come back to you, but I just want to set the scene for our viewers when we talk about working with the Republican Party, getting a Democratic agenda passed in Congress, because I want to bring everyone up to date. You just heard me discuss with the Congresswoman. You just heard me open the show. On the one hand, we have a Republican Party that's still hosting Donald Trump, at best turning a blind eye to his lies and his dangerous rhetoric, at worst, amplifying them. On the other hand, you have a Democratic Party whose leader and some members still want to work with Republicans all in the name of bipartisanship. President Joe Biden ran his whole campaign on being the deal maker who can work across the aisle. There's also, of course, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who, as we discussed extensively on this show on MSNBC yesterday, believes that even the right to vote has to take a backseat to 
bipartisanship. That was basically his argument in his op-ed yesterday in the Charleston Gazette Mail. But what the Bidens and Mansions of the Democratic Party seem to forget is that bipartisanship is actually a relatively recent phenomenon. It's not the historical norm in American politics or history. Partisanship, in fact, was key to passing early civil rights legislation, not bipartisanship. Look at this chart put together by Caltech historian and voting rights expert J. Morgan Cowser. Between 1866 and 1890, the Reconstruction era, civil rights legislation was passed on a purely partisan basis, with exactly zero Southern de Democrats, the pro-slavery politicians of that era, voting for any of these laws that you see on screen that includes the constitutional amendments that gave freed slaves citizenship and the right to vote. Does Senator Manchin think the Republicans of that time, Abraham Lincoln's party, should have held out for Southern Democratic support, for held out for bipartisan bills? As political scientists Thomas Mann and Norm Ornstein have pointed out, there's only one relatively recent exception to America's partisan norm. Quote, the period from the 1930s into the 1970s when a conservative coalition of Republicans and Southern Democrats worked together to form majorities and that bipartisanship was achieved at the cost of preserving and protecting Jim Crow, they say. And even in that elusive era of bipartisanship, by the way, the good old Senate filibuster came under critical scrutiny from a certain pastor. The tragedy is that uh, we have a Congress uh, with a Senate that has a minority of misguided senators who will use the filibuster to keep the majority of people from even voting. They won't let the majority senators vote. And certainly they wouldn't want the majority of people to vote because they know they do not represent the majority of the American people. Congresswoman Dean is still here with me. Congresswoman, given that history, why is there still this obsession by some in your party with bipartisanship, especially on voting rights, which is literally putting our democratic system at risk right now. What's terrific is you just detailed that history that I think many people sitting in Congress don't even appreciate. Uh, and I would take a look at something very recent, the American Rescue Plan. I'm very proud of that bill, sending billions of dollars across this country to communities in need. Yes. Uh, not a single Republican voted for it. So we don't need bipartisanship. Sure, we'd all prefer that, but it is not necessary. And we should not l allow uh, electeds to hide behind the filibuster. The filibuster is a tactic. It is not a constitutional norm. It is a procedural tactic yes. to stall legislation or to kill legislation. It is not what the framers conceived. They did not think that the minority should rule in most cases. Uh, what they thought was majority vote should be the norm and should pass the day. We are elected officials. And so when we get control of the House, for example, or we become a majority, we should be able to put legislation forward. We should not uh, hold ourselves hostage to the filibuster. So, we should end the filibuster. But so, I loved what Martin Luther King pointed out. What? It actually protects Jim Crow. This is a vestige of Jim Crow. Indeed, and yet certain Democratic senators refused to recognize that. We did hear President Biden take a veiled swipe at Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema last week, suggesting his agenda is being held up because of, quote, two members of the Senate who vote more with my Republican friends. Now, that's actually inaccurate. Manchin and Sinema do not vote with Republicans more than with Democrats, though they are currently an obstacle to much of the Biden agenda. I wonder, Congresswoman, does Joe Biden forget the kind of occasional public dig, but in private, maybe, does he need to be more forceful? apply more pressure on them, LBJ style? Does he himself need to be more full-throated about eliminating the filibuster as his predecessor Barack Obama has been? I have to admit, I don't think I will advise the president on this. I will stand on my own two feet and say we need to eliminate the filibuster. And then what I would ask, uh, honestly, of the senators, uh, Manchin and Cinema and any others, is okay, you wanna stand by the filibuster? What are you proposing for solutions to voting rights? What are you proposing to solutions to gun violence? I care desperately about gun violence. And yet year after year, Congress after Congress, those things are stymied. And, and somebody like a Senator Manchin says, well, I'm gonna support the filibuster. So tell me what are the honest to goodness legislative fixes to the Voting Rights Act, gun violence, opioid overdose death, 
uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, equality, and so much more. Uh, it's one thing to say you like to stand behind some tactic, which is literally a vestige of Bim Pro. Where are the solutions to the, where are the solutions in the Senate to the many bills we have sent over to the Senate? Yeah. Those are all great questions. I wish I could ask uh, Joe Manchin them myself, but he refuses to come on the show. Let's see if he changes his mind. Congresswoman Madeline Dean, Democrat of Pennsylvania, thank you so much for your time and your insights tonight. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.